Before introducing the next speaker, I would just like to add two sentences on myself. Um, I, I am, as you, as Eva said, Professor of Comparative Politics at the University of Bergen, but also Professor of Comparative Social Policy at the Hertie School of Governance in Berlin. And in that capacity, uh, I was there since it started in 2005, and in that capacity I also met Jürgen Kocker, partly because we collaborate with the Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin when he was director, and also he was uh, appointed uh, a member of the evaluation committee of the Hertie School. We are being evaluated all the time, and we offer at the Hertie School a multidisciplinary master program of public policy, and we have sociologists, uh, political scientists, economists, and lawyers, but you can imagine what his advice was, what discipline we were lacking, so he thought we should also need a professor of history. And I agree. And I think our next speaker is one who perfectly bridges history and the social sciences. I'm very glad to welcome back to Bergen, Sila Skotspol. Uh, she was here a few years ago as the, to give the Stenrocken Memorial Lecture. And um, she's now back. And she is, as you heard, P Professor of Political Science and Sociology at Harvard University which has also been Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences and Director of the Center for American Political Studies. She has been President both of the Social Science History Association and of the American Political Science Association, which has about 15,000 members, I think. Four years ago, she was awarded the Johann Schütte Prize in Political Science at Uppsala University, the highest ranking prize in political science in the world and for her visionary analysis of the significance of the state for revolutions, welfare, and political trust. Theda's work covers an unusually broad spectrum of topics, which a selection of her book titles indicates, such as monographs on states and social revolutions, which we have had on our curriculum compared to politics for many years, the prize uh, award-winning Protecting Soldiers and Mothers, Social policy in the United States, which I use in Berlin for my curriculum. Diminished democracy from membership to management in American civic life. And many, a long list of co-authored and co-edited books. Uh, one very famous one on bringing the state back in from the mid 1980s. Transformation of American politics, activist government and the rise of conservatism. And one book I was happy to be invited to make a contribution to social knowledge and the origins of modern social politics. And lately, Thera has taken a great interest in the Tea Party movements in the United States. And uh, we are glad that she can come and help us understand a little bit more of American politics. And her topic is on the, on the screen, uh, Tea Party mobilization and the future of American generationally uneven welfare state. Please, Thera. And it's a, a delight to be back in, in Bergen. I would like to thank the organizers of the Holberg Prize for inviting me, and uh, I'm very pleased to be able to help honor uh, Professor Koka on this wonderful occasion. Uh, I'm going to talk today about how uh, the historical institutional approach to uh, the study of public policy and civil society, civil society and the welfare state, can help make sense of some very current events. Um, my work over the last few years since I stepped down as dean has been focused on what's happening right now in the United States, but of course I believe that you need a broader theoretical and historical perspective to make sense of what is happening and what may happen next. So let me just start by setting the scene and reminding us of some of the remarkable turnarounds that have occurred just recently in the United States, and it may not be over. In 2008, the first African-American president of the United States, and I think the first person of African descent to lead any Western nation, was elected uh, by a substantial margin for a Democrat in the United States um, with a, an electoral coalition that included unusual mobilization of younger voters uh, and uh, uh, black and brown uh, uh, Americans uh, uh, of color. 
Two years later, in another election last November, um, the Republican Party in the United States experienced the sharpest gains in many, many decades. Uh, set back uh, a, a rebuke, you might say, to the uh, Democratic Party and President Obama, uh, greater than we've seen since the 1920s. And not only did the Republican Party come back to power in our House of Representatives and in many of our states, it took a huge leap to the right as measured by various uh, indices that political scientists use. Uh, to get, so the greatest polarization and the greatest shift in partisan uh, and ideological uh, uh, control in, in about uh, uh, half a century occurred. And since that election, after President Obama was elected in 2008, uh, two years later in March of 2010, the United States enacted the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which I'll call the Affordable Care Act for short, which was one of the biggest steps in the expansion of the welfare state in the United States since Social Security in the 1930s and the creation of Medicare for the elderly and Medicaid for the poor in 1965. The Affordable Care Act of 2010 has been called one of the most redistributive pieces of legislation to pass in the United States in recent decades. And what it promised to do was to extend a sort of state guarantee and state subsidies to provide universal health insurance in the United States for the first time. And I realized that everywhere else we've had it for a long time, but it would be a big deal for us if it were fully implemented after 2014. On the contrary, though, after 2010, when Republicans came back to partial power, they voted immediately to start a process of repeal of uh, the health insurance extension under Obama. They call it Obamacare. And um, they have also more recently put, voted uh, unanimously among the Republicans in the House of Representatives to take a further step of dismantling the Medicare uh, single-payer health insurance, universal health insurance for the elderly. So that if the direction that is being put in place now should uh, uh, be carried to fruition, not only would the United States fail to complete health insurance, a key component of a universal welfare state, it would actually step back and uh, place much more of the financial burden and the risk for health care of the elderly uh, on uh, families and those lucky enough to have health insurance through their, their private employers. So my puzzle is how do we make sense of all this and how do we do it quickly, since I don't have much time. Now what I want to suggest is that some of the obvious political science or historical answers don't really work. Um, it's true that in the United States, once one party gains the presidency in both houses of our legislature, there's always a pushback, but the pushback that occurred in 2010 was much greater, both ideologically and in terms of the number of seats. So it was beyond the normal cycle. And even if you factor in the huge financial and economic crisis that unfolded after late 2008, um, you can't really explain this as a simple uh, a side effect of economic dislocation. Uh, our Wall Street financiers are doing just fine. They haven't lost their legitimacy to the same degree that business and financial interests did in the 1930s. And those who have been most hurt by unemployment and by the economic downturn and the stagnating wages are not the ones who have been in the street or who have been driving the political agenda. On the other hand, we have had an explosive social protest in the United States that has unfolded since about one month into Barack Obama's presidency. The so-called Tea Party movement, you've probably all seen pictures of white Americans dressed up in colonial costumes um, and reenacting uh, a version of the rebellion against the British, the Boston Tea Party originally. Uh, and this movement has um, uh, exploded on the right of the Republican Party and has played a big role in pushing the agenda of debate uh, in a desired direction. 
Now, part of my research with some of my students over the past two years has been to try to understand this Tea Party movement and to try to, what is it and how do we understand its impact in the political process. I've used the usual combination of methodologies that my re research is known for, looked at the relationship of this movement to the political party system and to the institutions and policies of American government. I've also looked at it as a set of organizations, and I'll say more about that in a moment. But it is also true that for the first time, my students and I have actually gone out and talked to people face-to-face. Uh, -face. So uh, we've had a chance to interview uh, Tea Party members and organizers in Massachusetts, Virginia, and Arizona. And that component of actually hearing what people have to say and what they're thinking uh, is, a, is, I have to say, a very, very valuable supplement to what you can learn from reading the media or even from the best surveys. And there are endless surveys in the United States now asking Americans whether they support the Tea Party, whether they're in the Tea Party, what they think of it, et cetera. But those are national surveys and don't get in depth into what people think and believe. Now, the background for this research is that in these long, ongoing debates about whether civil society and the welfare state are complementary or crowded one another out, um, I have a particular angle of interest. I'm interested in particular in the relationship between citizen associations and citizen movements and the growth of the welfare state, which is a slightly different take than the one that um, Professor Conrad laid out. Um, um, those questions have to do with how welfare state services are implemented, co-production, and I, I endorse much of what he had to say about the complexity of that. The other side of it is the creation or, or rescinding of welfare state policies in the first place, what kinds of political support and movements go into those, and I think there is a long, there are a long series of debates about that where my position would be um, still friendly to the social democratic argument about um, a modifying and building upon it. I think there is strong evidence that historically uh, labor movements, labor union movements were important in both creating and sustaining, uh, particularly the universal aspects and the public funded aspects of the welfare state. We know that in many places it was farmers' movements along with the labor movement or alliances between Christian um, uh, uh, Democrats and social Democrats that were important. And in my research, I've looked at the United States over the 19th and 20th century and found that even in a welfare state that is very partial, uh, in its development by European standards, there was a powerful relationship between associations of citizens that met regularly in local settings, tied into state and national federations, and the growth of social policies benefiting farm families. Women's movements were important in the development of, uh, of our first welfare programs and our supports for family uh, well-being. Uh, old people's movements important in, both in the growth of the welfare state for the elderly and in its defense over the last 15, uh, 50 years. And of course, our military veterans, both during the Civil War period and probably one of the most generous of American social policies created after World War II in our GI Bill to pay for the education and family support of returning military veterans. It was a military veterans organization, the American of uh, the uh, the um, American Legion, that actually wrote that bill and helped to sustain it. So, the backdrop at which I'm looking at the Tea Party is that historically in the United States, there's been a strong positive relationship between citizen associations that had a face-to-face -face meeting component and a capacity to influence state and national politics and the growth of public social spending for opportunity and security. The Tea Party seems to contradict that because, as I'm going to tell you in a minute, it does have a strong face-to-face -face component of local meetings, remarkably, for this period of American civil society. But it also, at least on the surface, appears to be very hostile to the welfare state because its chief visible demand is immediate, rapid cuts in public social spending. So let me talk a little bit about that. 
Our research on the Tea Party, I've also already described the mix of methods that we've used. And let me tell you very quickly what some of the key findings are. Both in our research and in research that others have done, it's clear that this is a formation supported at the grassroots by white middle class Americans who are slightly more educated than average and slightly higher income than, uh, than, than median or typical for Americans. And that makes sense because they are older Americans. They are almost all middle-aged or older. And indeed, in the meetings that I've attended, I fit right in. <laughs> uh, the heads are gray or graying. They, this is a movement that originally was discussed, uh, there was speculation that it was people in the middle between the Democrats and the Republicans. That is absolutely untrue. It is people who are very conservative, regular Republican Party voters, or to the right of the Republican Party. They might call themselves independents because they are libertarians or because they are disgruntled with the Republican Party, but from the right. Uh, it was not a movement launched by the Republican Party, even though everybody in it is both voting for Republicans as opposed to Democrats in a system where you basically have two real choices, and everybody in it is trying to pull the Republican Party further toward the right. So that's another very important finding. As a formation, it came together suddenly in 2009 because it had the communications support of the Fox media empire and the entire right-wing media empire tied to it. In the United States these days, we have a little bit of the 19th century where we have a right-wing media that's openly aligned with the Republican Party and forces to the right. And then we have a 20th century media, which is everybody else trying to be balanced. Uh, you can imagine what that results in. Um, but um, in our research, we, sh we were able to show by tracing transcripts and looking at the timing that the Fox kind of build up for the initial protests and the communication helped people to find out about the Tea Party label and to come together for the initial protests. Nevertheless, the Tea Party includes, yes, what we call right-wing media impresarios or cheerleaders. It also includes a very important grassroots component. It is not correct to say that this is an entirely manufactured or media uh, uh, formation. Uh, we have a nationwide database of, on local Tea Party groups that have a, a presence on the web, and we have found 1,000 of them across the United States. They have somewhere between 50 and several hundred members apiece, sometimes as many as 1,000. And in most cases, they meet regularly, once a month and sometimes even once a week. So there is an important grassroots component that was spontaneously organized from below. It did not convert pre-existing organizations, such as Christian right organizations, even though many Christian right people joined the Tea Party. And it was not created through the Republican Party, but apart from it. Um, and finally, the Tea Party includes a, a, a major set of what we call roving billionaire-backed advocacy organizations. Uh, you have to think of the Tea Party as a confluence of media cheerleading, local organizing by these white, older, middle-class Americans, and then ultra-right-wing free market organizations that have been putting out policy proposals and sending money to politicians for decades, but in some cases renamed themselves after the Tea Party emerged, or if not, linked themselves to the Tea Party to provide support, encouragement, and above all, policy ideas to these new local groups and to the politicians that they helped to elect. So another way of putting it is that the chief finding in our research is that the Tea Party is neither purely top-down nor purely bottom-up, but a very interesting and dynamic combination of both. And it is that dynamism that has enabled it to push the Republican Party toward the right and then to feed policy ideas to newly elected Tea Party Republicans when they get into office at the state or national level. Um, 
the final thing that we found, and above all through our research, is that Tea Party people at the grassroots are not simply against government or against government spending. Now, I have to tell you, I was skeptical from the start. How can you have a bunch of 55 to 80 year olds, and that's the age range really, uh, who are against public spending? when the major things the American government spends its money on, apart from a vast military establishment, are insurance programs for the elderly. Let's remember, America has a very generationally uneven welfare state. We do very little for working-aged families in the middle of life, unless they happen to have insurance or pensions through their private employers, which they decreasingly do. Uh, we do a little bit for the very poor. But America's universal, generous, and expensive welfare state, since 1965 and 70 in particular, is Social Security pensions for the elderly plus Medicare uh, health insurance for the elderly. So many of the people who are out there with the colonial costumes demanding an immediate cut in public spending are in fact on Social Security and Medicare or will be very soon, and many of them are also on veterans programs, military veterans retiree or health programs. So in our interviews, we asked people, we got to it gradually, but we asked them, you know, what did they think about these programs? Here's what we learned. They believe that Medicare and Social Security are earned benefits that have been paid through, for through work and through taxes by people who have been real productive Americans all of their lives. On the other hand, the Affordable Care Act that Obama put through and the various emergency measures during the Great Recession are welfare handouts for undeserving categories of people who have not earned them and who have not paid for them. The word freeloader is frequently used and they may be paid for if they become more expensive, Tea Partiers fear, by increased taxes on people like themselves or by cutbacks in Medicare uh, for people like themselves. So talking to people, you discover that this is yet another iteration of a long running political battle in the United States about social insurance versus welfare, but with an important new twist. And one of the important new twists is that the Tea Party is not so much uh, against black people, it's worried about brown people. And here's where the demography of the United States is very important. Between 1924 and 1965, immigration into the United States was restricted. Most of the people who are now elderly grew up in a, a, a more white America or in an America where immigrants from Europe were assimilating to the Anglo-Saxon norm. Since 1965, immigration has speeded up and it is disproportionately black and brown people, particularly brown people from Mexico and Latin America. Those people are, even though they work very hard, are very frightening culturally to the older whites. Two-fifths of all children in the United States now on whom health and education spending would be expanded under Obama's policies are of color four-fifths of the elderly are white. So we have a clear generational conflict that is also racially tinged and tinged with fears about change of the kind that immigration brings. And I, I know that in Europe, people are familiar with different variants of that. So the way to understand the Tea Party is as a generationally based spasm of anxiety and anger about a changing society uh, Obama, turns out, was the perfect symbol to exacerbate all of those fears. A black man with a foreign father, and I actually think the foreign father is more important uh, than the black skin, uh, that young people love, and many of the Tea Partiers speak with contempt about the young including young in their own families, because they don't understand the changing circumstances of family formation and labor force entry for younger people, how much harder it is. So 
a president loved by the young, black, foreign father, friendly to Europe. They think he might be friendly to Europe. <laughs> they don't like that. Uh, and arriving at the time of an economic crisis with all Democrats in Washington, the perfect formula from the grassroots Tea Party perspective for expanding the kind of public spending they don't want, probably at their cost. That's where the economic crisis exacerbates those fears. Now let me just wrap up by saying the result of that anxiety and that remarkable mobilization, I mean these, these old folks are actually doing a wonderful job of organizing and I admire it as a student of civil society. Um, I had a young student come from Harvard into my, young libertarian come into my office to say that he, th he thought one young libertarians should link up with the Tea Party to teach them how to organize and I lowered my glasses and said, ah, oh, they don't really need your help. Uh, they've, uh, they're doing a great job. And uh, so, it's a remarkable grassroots mobilization. But that grassroots mobilization has, as you can imagine, had unintended effects or surprising effects. First of all, it contributed to the huge leap to the right and the major boost that the Republicans got in 2010 because after 60% of Americans voted in 2008, only 40% of Americans voted in 2010 in a midterm election. The electorate as a whole was skewed toward white, older, richer voters. They were the people listening to the Tea Party and they were the ones who were worried that Medicare would be cut to pay for affordable care. So the, the movement at the grassroots boosted the extent of electoral victories. Then after the electoral victories, the roving billionaire-backed ideological advocacy groups promoting ultra-free market ideas swooped into Washington and handed ideas to the Republicans to vote for, which they've been doing like lemmings. Um, and that's how you get a movement of older people who are on Medicare and Social Security contributing to the strength of an, an ideological formation in the Republican Party that has just voted to dismantle Medicare for the future. Uh, that makes the next two years even more interesting as we go into the 2012 campaign because whether Obama is reelected or not will determine whether the step forward in the Affordable Care Act toward universal health insurance is completed and it may determine whether uh, earlier steps to create a generous uh, uh, insurance system for the elderly that allowed them the time and the health to organize the Tea Party is dismantled uh, in the wake. Because if Republicans take all three branches, the Senate, the House, and the uh, presidency in 2012, there'll be great pressure to move forward with uh, substantial privatization of Social Security and Medicare. I don't know how it's gonna turn out, but I do know it's going to be very interesting. This is a great time to be studying American politics. There's, it's never dull, and there's plenty to think about in the surprising and often ironic twists in the relationship between our developing civil society and our generationally uneven welfare state. So thank you.